I think um, we can get going. Uh, hello, welcome. Um, welcome to the uh, virtual public meeting for West Denver Safer Streets about uh, Tejon, Virginia and Tennessee corridors. Uh, we are going to just wait a few minutes and make sure people have time to join your neighbors and, and uh, friends. So just hold on for a few minutes and then we'll get started. Uh, thanks again for taking the time. Hello again, just a reminder to those that joined, we're just waiting another minute here for to make sure people get into the meeting and get settled and um, before we get started. Appreciate your patience and thank you for joining us this, this evening. We'll just start in about a minute. Okay, I think that's enough time and people can join us um, as we're moving through this. My name is Chris Vogelsang. I'm be kind of um, hosting the meeting here. I just wanted to start this meeting to remind, um, or actually to just let everyone know that there is a second audio uh, language channel available this evening. And I'm gonna introduce our interpreter, Diego, um, to kind of run through how you get to that channel. Diego. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, buenas noches a todos. Can everyone hear me okay, first of all? ¿Me pueden escuchar bien? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes. yes. So I'm Diego Pons, and I'm here today on behalf of the Community Language Cooperative. Uh, so the organizers of this meeting would like to have made a commitment towards language justice. So this is means that we're here to help create a space so that everyone can participate and engage in the language of the heart, which is just simply the language that you feel most comfortable in. So we'll use simultaneous interpretation to help create the space in English and in Spanish here in Zoom today. When I finish saying this in English, I'll repeat it in Spanish. At that moment, the interpretation will be turned on. When the interpretation is on, you'll be able to observe a globe icon that says interpretation in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, the interpretation is not quite yet turned on, but soon it will be. Once it is, select that globe icon and please select your preferred language. Um, if you happen to be joining this meeting today on your cell phone or your tablet, please look for the more button or the three dots option in order to select your preferred language that way. If you happen to not be bi fully bilingual, please select your preferred language so that you can utilize the interpretation in case you were to need it. But if you are bilingual, feel free to listen to everyone in their original language and you won't have to hear me, the interpreter. Uh, when you select your language, you can always check the original audio so that you don't have to hear both languages at the same time. And I always have a special ask for English speakers, and that's just that you pay attention to the speed in which you speak, primarily if you're reading material off of a computer screen or a sheet of paper, since Spanish tends to be about 20% longer than English, so thank you for that consideration. Uh, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Mi nombre es Diego Pons, y estoy aquí hoy de parte de la Cooperativa de Justicia del Lenguaje. Gracias por invitarme a la reunión de hoy. Los organizadores de esta reunión se han comprometido hoy a servir la justicia del lenguaje. Y lo que eso significa es que queremos crear un espacio para que todos puedan participar e involucrarse en el idioma de su corazón, que es simplemente el idioma en que todas las personas se sientan más cómodas. Hoy vamos a utilizar la interpretación simultánea para poder crear ese espacio en inglés y en español aquí en Zoom. Y cuando yo termine de decir esto, se va a activar la interpretación. En ese momento usted va a poder observar un icono de un globo terráqueo que dirá interpretación ahí abajo en la derecha de su pantalla. 
hagan clic cuando vean ese icono del globo terráqueo y por favor seleccionen su idioma preferido. Uh, aún no está aprendida la interpretación, así que no se preocupen. Pero si usted está asistiendo hoy a esta reunión en su celular, en su tableta, le voy a pedir que por favor busque la opción que dice More, que quiere decir más, o el botón de tres puntos para que pueda seleccionar su idioma preferido de esa manera. Yo le pido a usted que si no es completamente bilingüe, seleccione su idioma preferido, por favor, para que pueda utilizar la interpretación en caso de que sea necesario. Pero si usted sí es bilingüe, siéntese libre de escuchar a todos hoy en su idioma original. Y cuando usted seleccione su idioma, siempre puede hacer clic en silenciar el audio original para no escuchar ambos idiomas al mismo tiempo. Muchas gracias. Great. Thank you, Diego. I appreciate that. So just to remind everyone, welcome uh, to our virtual public meeting. Uh, we're meeting tonight about South Tejon, West Virginia and West Tennessee corridors. I do want to welcome uh, Councilman Jolan Clark uh, to the meeting. Thank you, Councilman, for attending. I uh, appreciate your time. So a couple quick uh, housekeeping items. So code of conduct. So we wanna make sure this is kind of the same as being in a, a room together at the high school or, or in a meeting room. Be respectful and courteous. We have muted everyone in this main room uh, to keep distractions from background noise down. Um, you can use the chat window uh, to ask a question or, or give us a comment. What I want to emphasize is that we are going to have um, breakout rooms, uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much time we have, to have really good in-depth discussion about all the uh, discussion about all the details of the corridors. So if you have questions about specific details, best to hold those until our breakout rooms. If you have general questions like how do I um, get to the Spanish interpretation or, you know, what's um, when will this information be posted, feel free to ask that in the chat. Our agenda this evening. So we're gonna spend about a half hour up front just going through a program overview. We're gonna demonstrate the online comment tool to make sure you know how to go and give us specific detailed comment about the 60% the, the, uh, designs. And then we're going to give a highlight of the updates um, since you gave us input at the concept design level uh, that, have, that have been included in the designs. Then we're going to go to breakout rooms. And I have it listed as 6 to 6.45. We can go as late as 7 o'clock if we need it. We want to make sure everyone has time to talk. We've set up four breakout rooms, uh, one for residents that live on or near Tejon Street, one for residents that live on or near West Virginia, one for residents that live on or near West Tennessee, and then one room for people that don't live on or near directly any of those corridors or that want to speak about all three or, or various corridors. So that's how we're set up this evening. With that, I want to pass it over to Geneva Hooten, the uh, Dottie project manager to give us a program update. Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everyone. My name is Geneva Hooten, and I see a lot of familiar faces and names tonight on the Zoom screen. So thank you so much for joining us. If it's your first time as joining us on one of these meetings, um, I wanna give a little bit of context as to how we got here tonight. So these corridors were selected in the Denver Moves plan in 2011, which is a citywide bike plan saying, let's figure out how we can get people to be biking and moving in different ways. And then again, these corridors were identified in 2015. And then once again, in the more recent Blueprint Denver Integrated Land Use and Transportation Plan. In 2017, the Denver voters passed the Elevate Denver bond, and that included a number of corridors, including these, which is how we were able to move these through plan design and then into construction. So as, as you can see on this map, that there are a lot of different corridors that are sort of com composing of the West Denver Safer Streets umbrella. And tonight we are discussing West Virginia, South Tejon, and West Tennessee. The intention is that we are going to share what we've learned from you, the feedback we got through the conveyo process. We are going to wrap these into a final design over the next few months. And then the intention is to install these as soon as next fall um, and into 2023. And the reason why we're working on these projects is because we have some really big goals as a city. One is that we want to eliminate all serious injuries and fatalities as part of the city's Vision Zero Action Plan. And the other is that we're trying to get people to move in different ways and to feel like they are comfortable in getting around in different ways that, that is not just driving alone in a car. So that means that we're trying to get people to telework, uh, which I think we've all, many of us have been able to do through the pandemic. 
we're trying to um, encourage more people to walk and bike and take transit. And so as part of that, we also want to then change the way that our streets function so that they are safer and more comfortable for people to get around in modes that are not just driving. And one of the reasons that we're trying to build a high comfort network across the city is that we know that we have certain riders who are really comfortable on a bike today, and they're going to be comfortable on lots of different kinds of streets. And then we have a huge chunk of the population, it's about 60%, that are interested in riding a bike, but might have some concerns about safety or comfort or just how the streets are functioning. And so as we are building out a bike network across the city, our goal is to really start attracting more people to riding a bike and to walking for more of their trips. So that's what we're working on tonight through these, through these three projects in particular. And as I mentioned, we've had two open houses so far, and I'll walk through some of the feedback we received in February and March. This is our third and final open house for these projects. And tonight we're sharing revised designs that we're going to then wrap into 100% design and go closer to construction. So back in February, we heard, um, and this was a, a meeting that actually had all of the corridors in West Denver safer streets. We heard, about parking concerns, some interest in kind of why were these routes selected as opposed to other routes. We heard a lot about, uh, a lot of concerns about crossing the railroad, particularly at La Pan in Virginia, and then some concerns about the impacts to businesses. At the March open house, this is where we had the concept designs for Tejon, Tennessee, and Virginia. And again, we heard a lot about speeding safety and wanting to make sure that these streets feel safe and comfortable for kids on their bikes getting to school. We heard a lot about the parking impacts of um, especially on the South Tejon corridor, more questions about design and routing, and then topography and saying this is a hilly part of town. Um, how are we accounting for that? And then um, as we go through the three corridors and before we go into the breakout rooms, we're also going to provide a little bit of um, more detailed input of what we heard through the conveyo and then how that has shaped the designs. And I'm gonna turn it back to Chris to talk about the interpretation. Right, just, um, thanks Gina, but just a quick reminder, if you've joined us since we started, we are offering a, a second audio channel with Spanish and the instructions are on the, uh, on the screen there for you to join that. Um, there's a globe icon at the bottom of the screen that you click and choose the language um, of your choice. I'll just give you a few seconds and we'll also put some instructions in the chat for you in English and Spanish. Okay, so now I want to turn it over to Kevin Rangel um, from OV Consulting to give us just a quick overview about this online comment tool and how to navigate it and how to leave us specific detailed comments. So Kevin, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can take over. Thanks, Chris. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Uh, there we go. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Kevin. And I'm gonna be going over a quick demonstration on how to add comments to the corridor designs using the Conveyo tool. So the first step is gonna be getting to the Conveyo website and opening up a fresh browser. You can get there by typing in the following URL. That's bit.ly forward slash WDSS comment. Once you hit enter, that'll take you to the homepage. And I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to the page before we get into how to add a comment. So here is a quick introduction. Um, it gives you a list of the corridors included as part of, as part of the West Denver Safer Streets project. Uh, following that, we have the 60% designs. So these links here take you to each of the 60% designs for the specific corridors. And then we have the meeting recordings for the open house number one. We have these in English and in Spanish if you'd like to go back and view them. And then we have contact information to get in touch with the project team. So I'm gonna scroll back up now and I'm going to take us to the 60% design for Tejon Street. You can get there by clicking this button here. 
And alternatively, you could also get there by hovering your mouse over West Denver Safer Streets, and that'll give you the following pull down menu. And here you can select between different corridors. Um, I'm just giving you a, an example of how it works. So went to Tennyson and then I can go back to Perry. And I do wanna note that Bates and Irving are currently the two corridors that have not been posted yet. So when you go to the website, you'll be able to see everything except for Bates and Irving. So going back to Tejon. So here we're in the project page and in the blue section here, you can see some background on the proposed bicycle facility for the corridor. And if you scroll down a little bit lower, you'll get to the 60% design. So this area here is where you view it. And it's also where you can include your comments. And you'll notice that the corridor has been split up into shorter segments so that we can fit it on the screen. Uh, Tejon, for example, has been split into the following four. So you can navigate to different sections by clicking this drop-down menu and selecting where you want to view. For example, here is Ohio to Custer Avenue. And alternatively, you could also select previous and you could also select next to get to the different sections. Apologize about that. I think my internet's being a little slow here. So there we go. Now that it's loaded, you can go to the panel on the right hand side and click zoom in. So you can get a more detailed view of the design as well as the, the comments included there. And you can also click and drag around so you can view whatever area you want to, uh, look at the different intersections. And now to add a comment, you click the comment button and you'll see that your cursor changed to a gray plus icon. You can click anywhere you want to within the map and then you'll get this pop-up menu here. So you can add your name and your email if you wanna share it with us. And then you can also add your comment in the text box here. Um, you can select your comment type and then add your comment. And to show you what that looks like, I've created a demo one here. Um, so this is what they'll look like when they're posted. You can reply to other people's comments and you can also like or dislike them. So it's interactive and um, you can respond to other fellow community members' comments like this. Uh, please do remember that comments are public. So remember to be polite. And lastly, I'll scroll down, scroll down a little further here and I'll show you this section called understanding the design. Here we have information about design elements included within the corridor. And then followed by that is uh, some recordings for open house number two in English and Spanish. So that concludes the demo. Um, feel free to drop any questions into the chat and we'll get back to you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. And um, I will I will share back the presentation. So that'll be that's that's a prime one of the great methods for you to see the design, give a specific detailed comment and let us know, you know, uh, adjustments we can make. And the more specific, the better. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm, we're going to get into the, the three corridors and how your input has shaped the, the designs. And the first, uh, first person we're gonna, first thing we're gonna talk about, we're gonna have Ryan Mulligan um, give us a little overview on Tejon Street. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Ryan Mulligan with Parsons Transportation Group. Uh, we'll be working on the design of these corridors. So South Tejon Street will travel from uh, Bayad south to Tennessee. It's about a mile and a quarter, um, and it'll be a protected bike lane. Uh, uh, next slide here, please. Um, so this will work to connect destinations. There are several schools on this corridor, including Belverde Elementary, KIPP, Sunshine Peak, and others. Um, and multiple parks along this corridor, not to mention connections to multiple transit routes, uh, the 3, 4, 11, 14. Um, it will also work to improve the crossing at Alameda and Tejon uh, to improve that for, for all modes while um, you know, helping lower the stress at that corridor uh, and also uh, provide connections to the existing bikeway on Bayod and the proposed and future bikeways on Cedar, Byers, uh, Tennessee, and Virginia, which we're also talking about tonight. <clears throat> so um, 
looking at the current state of mobility uh, on this corridor, vehicle speeds range between 25 on average, uh, between 25 and 33. That posted speed limit though is 25. Um, you had some traffic volumes you can see there that, you know, between about 4,000 and 6,000. Parking is uh, lightly utilized at about 10%. Uh, there is a history of crashes uh, on this corridor, including some fatalities as well. Um, so the, the uh, graphic there on the right with the, with the red dot, that's a graphic that's used to help determine the proper facility type based on the number of vehicles per day on the corridor, which you know we we spoke of, and the average speed. So, and the 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 speed, not the average speed, the speed on the corridor. So you can see that the um, protected bike lane there is is the preferred um, uh, choice given the realities on the ground. And I'll pass it off to Geneva. And um, something else to, to just kind of take into account with this corridor um, is the Athmer Park Street Safety Survey that was completed earlier this spring. Um, it was led by the Athmer Park Active Living Coalition. And this was a survey that was really trying to understand how do people feel and what are some of those perceived safety concerns around the neighborhood. And um, of that, we found a few pieces pretty enlightening. One being that almost 90% of parents feel very or somewhat uncomfortable or unsafe allowing their children to walk or ride a bike independently. And so when we think about the number of schools that are on this corridor, the fact that the library is just a little farther south than the where the protected bike lane is proposed, that we have this opportunity to really create a street that is safe and feels more safe for kids in particular so that parents will feel comfortable allowing their kids to bike to school alone. Um, and so we also want to create streets that are safe and feel safe for parents to accompany their kids as well. So with that, um, you know, we, we got lots of feedback from Conveo. The South Day Home Corridor was certainly one of the corridors with a number of comments. And they ranged from people who said, this is great. I'm so excited for this. I really um, support the, the safety improvements here. I think that this is going to help. Um, and then we also heard from folks who said, this is going to be a really big impact to me and my family and um, a theme of concern over parking loss. And then we also have heard concerns about safety and speeding. Um, we know of cars that have run off the road and, and gone into people's front lawns. Um, and this project is one of the things that will, that is expected to happen is that we will see a decrease in, in speeds. Um, because of sort of narrowing the field of, of vision. So what we're going to walk you through are, are a few changes to the design based on that feedback. One um, is in front of the school. The other is to address some of those concerns on the really long block between Ohio and Kentucky. Um, so Chris, if you'll go to the next slide for me. For those who are a little less familiar with the project, this is the most typical cross section for South Tejon Street where you would have um, a vehicular travel lane in either direction, an area of separation between the bike lane and the car lane with a vertical element, and then a, um, an area for, for people biking. So it's um, this would mean on-street parking removal throughout the corridor. Um, and with that also a lot of benefits to safety and to, to creating a street that feels more comfortable for people. And here I want to point out a few things. Um, at the next to the park, we're going to be able to integrate the existing median islands and really create a, a safer way to get to the park. At Bayod, our hope is to start integrating better with the bike lanes that are on Bayod. This is also where there was a fatality in 2019 where Scott Hendrickson was killed on his bike further emphasizing the need to really create a safer space for, for people biking. Um, and then as we go south and move towards Alameda, um, and in, um, yeah, that's fine. As we are moving south towards Alameda, uh, this will also mean that the DHA residents will be able to directly get onto a protected bike lane, making it easier to access things like the trail and the park and, um, and the schools. And here, one of the changes that we made to the design is just to kind of further emphasize the difference between the loading zone for school needs, um, bus and parent drop-off, 
Um, and that means that during those hours of the day, um, anyone who's traveling southbound on a bike would need to just get into the, the general travel lane and there will be a dedicated bike lane for northbound travel. And so knowing that we have a lot of students and a lot of folks who are working at these schools, we wanted to make sure that we were not interrupting um, any pickup and drop off for um, along, along that side of Tejon. And then next, one of the concerns that we heard through the conveyo and through office hours and other things is about how do we address the needs for people who have deliveries and other needs for people who are coming um, and visiting. And so understanding that most of the homes along Tejon do have driveway access, which helps someone can pull in and, and park in their driveway for a short-term need. Um, but we are also adding in three loading zones. And so this will be an opportunity for if there is an Amazon Prime delivery or USPS that that driver can, can pull into the loading zone. Um, and this is a, a way for us to really address some of those, those specific needs that we heard on the corridor. And um, yep, I'm gonna kick it over. Hi, uh, my name is Adam Jaden. I am uh, with Dadi Transportation Build. I'm the construction project manager for these projects. I'm going to be talking about uh, Virginia Ave, the 60% design. Um, for this corridor, we have a neighborhood bikeway from South Knox to Navajo, and then uh, from Navajo to the South Platte River Trail, uh, we have conventional bike lanes connecting to the, uh, the Platte River Trail there. Um, for those that aren't familiar or this first time hearing neighborhood bikeway, um, a neighborhood bikeway is a shared street. Uh, they have existing low volume and speeds, and we are using these to prioritize people walking and biking. Uh, some of our tools that we use for neighborhood bikeways when we're implementing these are traffic circles, as you can see in the top left there. Um, curb extensions, you can see in the bottom left. Uh, median islands, chicanes, pinch points, um, which you can see in the bottom right, as well as crosswalks for pedestrians to highlight um, pedestrian crossings. Um, and the general idea is reducing speeds, uh, making this more comfortable for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, you may also have seen, or you will see some of our neighborhood bikeway signs, uh, which are on the top right there, highlighting local destinations for cyclists uh, to get to using the facility. Uh, some of the benefits of the West Virginia have a neighborhood bikeway project. Uh, we have connections to Monroe Elementary, uh, on the west side, as well as on the east, we connect to the South Platte River Trail um, and the Johnson Habitat Park. Um, you know, we are improving crossings at intersections, high, specifically uh, South Federal Boulevard. Um, and then we have connections to RTD bus routes 30 and 31. And as I mentioned earlier, we're just improving safety in general for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, creating that low stress facility, um, as well as reducing uh, speeding on the corridor. Um, adjacent bikeways that will be intersecting or connecting to uh, the South Platte River Trail, South Knox Court neighborhood bikeway, and then um, the Tejon and Lapan Street bikeways, which are upcoming. Um, kind of talking or talking about our uh, mobility today and what led us to creating this facility. Uh, the posted uh, speed limit is 25 miles per hour. You can see uh, the low is 26 with a high of 28. We have fairly low volumes ranging from 1,400 to 2,100 vehicles per day. Um, and our crash, crash history is very significant with, you know, quite a number of vehicle uh, crashes as well as serious cyclist crashes and a fatality with the pedestrian involved. And so with the neighborhood bikeway, you know, we're trying to accomplish uh, creating just a safe facility for all users. So based on kind of what we heard from the public through the conveyo input was certainly a great deal about the speeding issues on Virginia and the data supports that. Not only is there a speeding issue, but there's also a pretty significant crash history. Um, a lot of support for traffic circles and other traffic calming elements, as well as noting how difficult the crossing at Lapan Street is. So I am um, gonna walk through some of these design changes. One of the primary changes is that 
due to a citywide study regarding speed cushions or speed humps, however you want to call them, uh, the current designs have those removed and in lieu of them, we have one lane pinch points and median islands. And these alternative options are also to help slow down cars, especially mid block and to overall bring down the speeds of vehicles that are traveling on Virginia to make it more comfortable for people walking and biking. Also, with the way that our data was collected for this project, it was greatly influenced by um, the constraints of COVID and we were able to recollect a little bit of data on Virginia, which showed that one of the diverters is very necessary and that was the diverter at Hazel Court and the one at Clay Street is not as necessary. So that is now removed from the design, which will allow through access um, along that portion of Virginia. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, please, and I can talk through those next. So what you'll see on this corridor is a mix of things like traffic circles and curb extensions. And both of these aim to slow down cars at the intersection and slow down turning movements, as well as make it a more comfortable place to cross the street which is great, um, particularly considering that we have Monroe Elementary and we have kids that will be walking to school. Um, and then as I mentioned, we are keeping the diverter at Hazel Court. So what this means is um, some of the volume that we're seeing on the corridor is at the farther, the most farther west edge. edge. And so um, we're seeing that cars are, are using Virginia to access federal, and this will prevent that through action by a car. Bikes will still be able to go. You can still make a right turn. If you come to the intersection um, on Virginia, you can turn right onto um, Hazel, but you won't be able to go directly to access federal. And um, with the removal of the speed humps, we added in one lane pinch points. You can see those locations here on the screen. And what this aims to do is the curb extensions and traffic circles really focus at the intersection. And this focuses on the mid block location where folks can typically pick up more speed. Um, and this forces folks to slow down, yield to one another, and overall we think will help improve the street and really make it more comfortable. And then at the farther, farther east side of the corridor between Navajo and the South Platte Trail, the land use here changes, as you all know really well, um, it's no longer just single family residential, it's more industrial. So we have a block of striped bike lane and then a block of buffered bike lane. And the reason for this is that we want to really formalize and make it clear where someone biking should be on the street and then where, say, a truck or some a heavier kind of vehicle should be. Um, and that a shared condition isn't quite as appropriate here. And I'll also note um, that we did evaluate the all-way stop control at La Pam Street and found that just because of some of the visibility constraints, we weren't able to add in um, stops for La Pan. We still know that that is a, a really big concern for the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, and then just finally, uh, one really exciting thing that has happened since we last spoke is there is another project that is working on adding curb extensions at West Virginia and the entrance to the South Platte Trail, essentially on Jason Street. Um, and so we are working together with that project and those curb extensions will be in concrete and not just um, sort of the quick build materials that we see on other corridors. So we're really excited about that. All right. Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Geneva. <clears throat> My name is Jeremy Kahn. I am a senior engineer with Dottie, and I'll be talking about the Tennessee Avenue design that we have running from South Vallejo Street to South La Pan. It's roughly a three quarter mile stretch of corridor where we are currently at 60% design level, and the facility that we have uh, selected to be implemented will be a neighborhood bikeway. Some of the benefits of the uh, implementation, uh, you know, when we're talking about these facilities, it's always about connectivity, whether it's to uh, specific destinations such as Hudson Lake Park or the Athmer Park Library um, or connections to future and or existing uh, bikeway facilities such as West Kentucky Avenue, South Tejon Street and South La Plan. 
And then it also addresses a major gap in our network, the east-west connection from Hudson Lake Park to, north, to the north-south plan bike facilities. And then as always, as we've kind of been, the, it has been the common theme throughout is it provides additional safety by providing a low stress bikeway and will help reduce speeding uh, with the implementation of such items that has also been discussed like traffic circles, median islands, pinch points, bulb outs, and then delineated pedestrian crosswalks. Um, moving on to again, the, the data and kind of how we landed on the neighborhood bikeway, uh, the vehicular speeds, and traffic volumes are, are everything in terms of determining the facility. And, and along Tennessee, we have vehicular speeds in the range of 27 to 28 um, with a posted speed of 25. So a little higher uh, than, than where we'd want them to be. But uh, the traffic volumes are much lower. And, and that allows us to kind of land in the, uh, the neighborhood bikeway range, which you're seeing there on the right. Um, and then we can mitigate speeds by implementing uh, the traffic calming methods that we've been talking about. And I'll pass it on to Geneva. Thank you. And on the Tennessee Avenue concept design, we did not receive a great deal of commentary. Uh, we did receive some comments saying that uh, there are folks who are using this corridor as a cut through, um, a lot of issues with Quivis and asking for there to be something addressing the issues at, at that street. Um, and so similar to what I was sharing with Virginia, we've also removed the speed cushions on this concept and instead have added in one lane pinch points and some other treatments. So on the next slide, you'll see what we are proposing at Houston Lake Park with the median crossings and really integrating better with the Kentucky Avenue buffered bike lane including a curb extension to make that crossing as, as short as we can make it. And then we're adding in um, another median island at Kentucky and Osage, as well as several pinch points through the design. And we can walk through those in the breakout room. Um, so again, our, our goal on this one, we don't have so much of a volume problem on Tennessee as we do that speeding problem. And so these mitigations are intended to make it slower and to make it a more comfortable place for people. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Chris. Awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your patience. I know we're seven minutes past the time we're going to go to breakout rooms. So I want to make sure we get in there. Like I said, we have until seven o'clock. Uh, we can let the discussion happen organically and go as long as we need to up till that time. So I want to go through these um, and make sure everybody knows where they where they should go and how to get there. So if you are a resident or someone that lives on or near the Tejon Street corridor, don't go anywhere. Don't choose a breakout room. You're going to stay right in this room. And uh, we're going to um, open up breakout rooms and people for the other rooms are going to go there. And the reason for that is so we can continue the Spanish interpretation in this room um, and have a, a good discussion and make sure everybody's well served. If you are a Spanish speaker, and you were interested in one of the other corridors, please stay here so we can help you um, because we'll have English and Spanish capabilities. So to reminder, if you wanna talk about Tejon, don't do anything, just be patient. And in one minute, we'll get started. If you are a resident that lives on or near uh, West Virginia, uh, there will be a breakout room choice for you to, to choose and go to that room. If you're a resident that lives on or near Tennessee, there will be a breakout room for that corridor you'll be able to choose Tennessee. And then if you don't live on or near any of these corridors, or if you're interested in say giving input on all three or multiple ones, we have a room um, for non-residents, a general area discussion room. So choose that room. Each of these rooms will be facilitated by someone who's knowledgeable about the corridors and be able to answer your questions, run through all the details with you. Um, and then the meeting, just to, as a note, the meetings will end from those breakout rooms. And so your facilitator will give you the next steps, how to give us detailed comment, and then thank you. And um, the meeting will end from there. So with that, I think uh, CV, if you could uh, activate the breakout rooms. Absolutely. I will, stop, I will stop sharing my screen and I will see everyone in the, let's go into the Tennessee room. Also, if you are not able to select a breakout room on your own, please just chat me and I will move you to a breakout room.
All right, let's wait a couple. Let's give it a one more minute uh, before we start our home discussion. Um, let's make sure that we have everybody uh, that is supposed to be in this room, in this room. <laughs> in the meantime, I am going to share. Oh, oh no. Um, CV, uh, yes. do not have the uh, ability to, I'm not a host. I cannot share my screen. Yeah, let's make you a co-host. There you go. Yeah, sorry you. about that. Mm -hmm. so all good. All right. So can everybody see my screen? Yeah, looks good, Gabby. Awesome. Thank you. All right. The, uh, cedar. May I? Well, that's on the other. Yes, so all right. So welcome everybody to the Tejon breakout room. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I guess we kind of uh, obviously through the main presentation, we, you know, Geneva was able to walk us a little bit through the Tejon uh, quarter, but this is more like a, like that open discussion. So if um, I do see that we do have a decent number of people here in um, in this room. So for the sake of trying to obviously keep everything uh, organized, let's, uh, let's see if we can, you know, sort of raise our hands. Um, let's, uh, and just tell me sort of what block or what kind of topics do we want to discuss uh, for, for this corridor. Uh, it's definitely more like that open discussion. Again, we definitely want that feedback through that Conveyo uh, tool that we have. Uh, but obviously we also have some staff members here that, that will be able to answer questions and be able to take down uh, comments um, as well through this as we continue this conversation. So with that, I know Councilman Clark, thank you for joining us in this room. And I see Tate also, I believe is in this room. Um, I guess, uh, who wants to start? I'm not seeing any raised hands or, but feel free to just uh, unmute yourselves and let me know. Um, I guess, Timothy, I think that you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, what block do you want at, me to go to or what kind of questions you have? We're at exposition. At exposition. All right, let's go Between to- Between exposition and Ohio because we're the second house on the west side up from exposition. Oh, what well, I am here, exposition in Ohio. Can you see? Yes. Right here where my finger is on yes. the second house. So what kind of questions do you, do you have, Timothy? And I'm sorry, I can I can barely hear you. So, uh, or your wife, I'm sorry. You're looking at putting those blocks on the field here. Uh, what? Why can't you just paint them? Because of our parking. Uh, I mean, that's my wagon in the uh, Plymouth out front. Where are we supposed mm -hmm. to park it? And if I'm going to make a plan on graveling the yard. To make a driveway. How am I supposed to be getting in with those blocks and everything there? I get on it. I don't know because I hit the mute. So and the house has got a driveway. How are people supposed to get into their driveway? So you know, obviously the protected bike facility, as we explained, you know, during the main presentation, because of the speeds and volumes that the horn is seen, it based on our on our guidelines, it requires us to install a protected facility. Um, so for the folks that are do have driveways right now in the corridor, we are not placing the protective elements in front of their driveways. So of course, you know, we don't want to block the driveways. So if when you zoom in into the conveyor, when you go into the design, so for example, okay, so here's a, you know, basically here's a driveway right here. We don't have anything blocking the driveway. So people are still going to be able to utilize their driveway. Okay. Uh, so. The other question is, this is a, a big question. First off, there's not that many bicyclists to start with in this area. And the other thing, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm 61. I've been raised in this town. I was raised over there by Colorado, Mississippi. But what I remember, bicycles are supposed to follow the same rules as cars. They're supposed to stay on the right side. They're supposed to stop at the stop sign, 
obey all, you know, all regular, you know, traffic laws. And most of the people I see, uh, they just, the bicycle, they'll just ride in the center of the street, they ride up the wrong side of the street, going the wrong direction, or ride on the sidewalk. Uh, they don't pay attention to the stop signs, they just blow right through them without paying attention. Uh, same way with pedestrians. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great point, Timothy. Hey, my name is David. I work for I work for Johnny, and you know your comment about the unpredictability of behavior is a really important point. And one of the things that we find is that you know it's easier for people to have predictable um, behavior when everyone has a space on the road. And now you know um, now there's a space, a dedicated space where bicyclists are supposed to be. And you know the reason you don't see a lot now is because it's not a comfortable place to ride, and this will help make it a more ride. So um, that's kind of the the two point part there. You know that it one it's more comfortable to ride, and two it also makes it more predictable. So it's easier to uh, expect where someone's going to be riding, and you know you will see improved behavior. Well, I understand. I understand that, but I. I worked for a, a construction company that did that bicycle lane out in Aurora, uh, just south of Mississippi. And when we were installing the signs, it was surprising that the bicyclists weren't even using it. I mean, they did a two-way deal uh, strictly for the bicycles on one side of the road. And the bicycle some of the bicycles weren't even using it. It's no different than like even some of the pedestrians. I mean, you have to remember I was raised in the 60s and 70s, but 60s, our parents taught us when you come up to an intersection, you look both ways, uh, you make sure it is clear before you cross the street. Yep. Now I, now I know that, yes, uh, there's pedestrians have the right of way, but that's also at intersections with a crosswalk. But still, <laughs> the thing is, people keep forgetting uh, a 4,000 pound car, a two ton car, is still going to win. So, why can't people realize, okay, I'm better off being safe and making sure? The road is clear here before I cross. Yeah, uh, it's a great, it's a great point. Vehicles will win, and that's all the whole point of making this a separated facility so that there isn't that conflict, so that a vehicle doesn't have to win, so that we can all coexist safely together. That's a, yeah. a really important so, point, and and emphasizes why we're doing this facility. So well, let's take. What, so sorry, Timothy. Just for like getting everybody else. Also, I see Debbie that has her hand up. Uh, actually, that's my wife. No, no sorry. On the, oh, on the, oh, Debbie, Debbie Ross. Go ahead. Yeah, Debbie I Ross. don't know how this works very well, so I'm just, I don't know if you can see us or not. Yeah, no, no. I see you, Debbie. So go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's your question. For him or me? For Debbie Ross. <laughs> for <Okay>. you. <laughs> well, my thing is we've had this house for about 46 years. So we've lived in this neighborhood for a very long time. The amount of bicyclers, even when my children were little, were not out here, that, and all the schools were full. We did not have the need to uh, banish all the parking and everything else for that, for the amount of bicyclers that are on this street. And it's not a safe street. Within a six month period of time, we had two vehicles in two different accidents totaled in front of my house from cars. And then I was sideswiped once. So that was within a six month period of time. And they speed through here and stuff. And this is just gonna make things worse. It's not gonna protect everything, but it's gonna make it hardship because if you were back that time, the majority of these homes did not have driveways. And the driveways that are there now have gone in at owner's expense. I don't have the money to put a driveway in my, and if I park up on my yard, then the city's on my butt for that and tell me you can't park there. So where am I supposed to park? I'm 65 years old. 
and I've got to park at the end of the street, maybe, if there's a place. I can't park in the alley and stuff, they're not safe. Every time I've tried, my car gets broken into or vandalized. People had bullet holes in their vehicles and stuff out there. So you're gonna protect all these non-existing bicyclists and stuff that are up here, going straight up and down T-Home. But what about the residents that actually live here? You know, you're making it harder for some of the older people and stuff. I get home with my groceries. How many trips do I got to make back and forth just to get my groceries home? As, as it is, it's hard enough. You know, I mean, and we did not get in on any of these surveys or nothing. It wasn't until the plans were already made that the majority is a, of us have even heard about it. And you guys, it's like you're not even listening to us. What there was almost 100% of the people didn't want just a fraction what he said 118 116 people on T home signed a thing that they did not want the protected bike lane in here. A bike lane maybe is, is right, but they're not watching it and stuff and the only time anybody does anything about the speed is if you sneak a cop in here and he catches them. Otherwise they're out here on ATVs the mini motorcycles, all this kind of stuff, zooming up and down the streets, nobody's stopping any of that. And they're running the stop signs and stuff. It, but yet you're gonna make us suffer. It's not right. I don't have a place to park. You guys do this, we're not gonna have a place to park our vehicles. And I can't afford a driveway. Oh, I got, I got some very valid points of safety, safety issues. The thing was all about being safe. Well, this is a, a uh, plow route. Okay, now if this do not get plowed because there's not enough room for the plows to come through, how are our ambulance and our, and our fire trucks going to get up here and help anybody, especially up the hill here between Exposition and Ohio? Yeah, uh, our, it's, our, it's our, designs are, our designs are reviewed by our operations and our fire teams. So, you know, our they're the, compliant. They're compliant. There's not going to be enough room here. As it is, the, the car slip and slide down the hill uh, all, all the time here. And, and there's always accidents at the yeah. bottom of the hill. Yeah. yeah the, the plans, I, I that, that's the topography, obviously, of Denver. But our plans are reviewed by all of our different divisions and departments. And mm -hmm. we wouldn't be implementing this if, if, obviously, our fire, we don't have emergency access or um, our operations team cannot plow through the road itself. That's well, even the street sweeping and stuff, that's going to be an issue with these protected bike lanes. It, right. I mean, if they brought, you still had a bike lane, but you didn't take away all the parking and stuff out there, there's a lot of us here that cannot afford to put a driveway in. Denver doesn't want to be filthy, and they're not going to be able to clean these streets. Yeah, the, there's a there's equipment that's designed to uh, monitor and and mo and sweep these facilities. Denver has two of the well. sweepers downtown, and they don't, they don't have enough for the... They're, unless they're going to buy a home, they're going to spend a fortune on them. He worked for the city doing that kind of stuff, the street sweeping and stuff. And the new sweepers that they got right now, they don't clean the street. It just pushes it around. It's not really cleaning them. The stuff I've been there, here in this neighborhood 27 years, and I take all the other side streets. I, every time I ride my bicycle in other parts of town, I don't look just for one one road to go up one road that's going to be a safe bike lane. You, you, I go all the streets. And, and that and is this, this doesn't this is I don't think it warrants just for a few bicycles 20 out of 27 years I've only seen five bicycles come up this street and I know you say because it's not safe well there's streets there's streets to show them there's human chill you can go up any of these streets and there there's no traffic when you're going to ride through Denver you got to be able to ride uh, crisscross through any anywhere to get you get your shortest route to get where you need to get yeah, that's what we're trying to avoid is that people on bikes and people walking have every bit is right to walk in and travel in a direct route, just like someone in a car does. And so we're trying to give them a high comfort, safe, direct route that has signals at major intersections, uh, give people the dignity and the option to travel safely. So in, the same way that, in the same way that we have the different have facilities or roadway facilities, the same way that we have our, our different roadway facilities, arterials like federal, you know, obviously, you know, we have the collectors and the locals. We're trying to establish the same thing for our bicycle network as well. But there's not that many cyclists out of the because 40. We don't have a connected network. 
because okay, we have we another... been in this neighborhood for so over let's see how many people years. are going to ride up here. It's not going to be worth the money. It's going to be a lot of money spent, and that for could be so few to ride. That could be spent on other things instead of putting a major, major hardship right. on the residents that have bought a home. You buy a home so that you can park close to your thing, not clear down the block. You can't see your vehicle down there. They're going to get broken into, stolen. If I park behind my house, every single time I park behind my house, it has gotten broken into or vandalized. There's too many things to open down the alleys here. Uh, too many bad people. There's, there's, it's not safe in your alleys or walking around the corner at night when you got to come home. And this is li yeah. me. We're living here for over 46 years and dealt with all this kind of stuff. And you guys just make it harder and harder. You can't park up on your yard or something or the city's out here and then you're gonna get fined for it. Unless you go through all this stuff of putting this in, this in and this in. I don't have thousands of dollars to have someone install one. And if I do it myself, that that's a hell of a lot of work. If you've ever put in pavement or something, that's a lot of work. And a lot of expense, even if I did it myself. And it, I think it's just a big waste of money. That's, yeah. that's my, my, my. I mean, I buy a home and I can't even. Park we, next we hear what so you're Ryan, saying. We, yeah, we Ryan. You're so, saying. would you mind, Debbie? By uh, so, Debbie Ross, but can you tell, or uh, would you mind sending either sending us an email, or would you mind telling us what block do you live in, so that we can enter your comments? Block? I live in a house right here, right at I'm the sorry. top of the hill between Ohio and Exposition. Okay, so this right row as well. So and Ryan, thing in, yeah, okay. So Ryan, would you mind putting in on the conveyo uh, basically comments? Obviously, I see that these houses right here doesn't look like any of them have you know the driveways, just so that obviously the, the team, the design team is aware. Yeah, yeah. and if you go back several, mm -hmm. several years, like the 40, 50 years, and compare these things, you're gonna see that uh, the majority of these homes did not have driveways. A lot of people have put them in at their own expense for one right. reason or another. And you'll see in spirits, there's some houses where you have large group families. They don't have just one or two cars. They have three right. or four or five cars. Some of them are even jammed and packed in there. That's going to put an impact on them. Absolutely. Yes. So, and this is the public right away. So as Denver continues to grow, we're trying to achieve our goals of becoming, you know, a robust multimodal city. You know, we have to figure, you know, we have to figure out ways of utilizing the public right away in the best format that helps the most amount of residents. And that might be that, but then you're taking away everything else. We have a vehicle. So, we pay license fees and stuff and driver's license fees and stuff to be able to be out on these roads. Bicycles, as well as the majority of bicyclists that are out there as well. They're not taking tests to prove that they're safe cyclists. And they're not paying all this extra money and stuff. That's so, what our tags so, are. Sure, they, Thank they you. actually do. The, a lot of people who ride their bikes also own cars. And pay, yes, pay, the majority of us. So. They, they pay and just I'm not like saying, you. But you got a lot so, of... So th let's take a, another question uh, from other residents. That I, I The other... I see your hand, but let me see if there are any chance we have any other resident that also wants to speak up since uh, Timothy spoke a little bit earlier. Do we have anybody else in the in the in the group? Gabby, you oh, have I, John Hanna and oh. Kiara Chavez who both have their hands up. Okay, yeah. thank you. So hi, John, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I've, I've got two questions, but I think they're brief. Um, the first one is you mentioned that it's been said over and over that the the protected bike lane, rather than just uh, a painted stripe down the street, is needed because of the primarily because of the volume of traffic. Is that correct? And speed, correct. And speed. Volume and speed. Okay. So, uh, as I go around our neighborhood here, you know, nearby, we've got Florida Avenue to the south, Morrison and Kentucky and Westwood, Knox, um, north of Alameda all appear to be busier than to home and have um, unbuffered bike lanes. So that just doesn't seem to add up. That they've got more speed, they've got more volume, and yet they don't have the protect protection. So can you speak yeah, to there's, that? Yeah, there's a good reason for that, John. So, um, you know, bicycle facility design is an evolving practice. 
And, uh, you know, we are now, we are moving towards safer facilities and standards and installations, things we would have done, uh, you know, three years ago, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago are not the same decisions we'd make now. We're learning more about the field and we're learning more about designing facilities that actually support people changing behavior. But this is in alignment with best practice in terms of installing things that are safe for everyone that actually changes behavior. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to just build out the network for people who are already riding. A body of research out there, you know, that we referenced earlier that shows that 60% of the people who live in the Denver metropolitan area want to ride their bike but don't feel safe. And this is this this is this type of installation that we hear over and over again helps people actually ride who are not riding. So that's okay. sort of the reason why you see facilities uh, with different speeds and volumes. I mean, I'd also, you know, you actually have to go out and collect the data statistically to say, not just, you know, oh, I was there and it looked like people were going faster. You know, like you actually have to compare apples to apples here. Um, that's the other side of it as well. Okay, got it. Um, the, my, my second question is the, um, it appears that the part that gets the most volume of traffic is between Virginia and Alameda. Um, is that correct? I'm not along the stretch of Tahoe. Between Virginia and Alameda. Um, I don't, I don't, uh, Ryan or, or David, do you have the numbers? I will probably take it potentially. Could, I'm not, a, I, I'm, I wouldn't be able to say 100% because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but obviously that's the area that has the school. Right, right. So uh, obviously I don't there's have a lot of movements that happens there. Yeah, Gabby, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe that is the busiest section, obviously, in off peak um, has has different peaks as well, given uh, right. the, the schools there between uh, Virginia and Alameda as well. Okay, so my question is, we have a protected bike lane from Virginia to Tennessee, but between Virginia and Alameda, three of the four blocks where it has the most volume will not be protected. Um, that doesn't seem to add up to me also. It seems like that's where we would most need it, but because of student pick up and drop off the two blocks in front of the Richel campus, and because of the narrowness of the street, that last block before Virginia, it just won't work to put in the buffers. So that just leads me to question, are we really providing a protected bike lane especially for riders who you know, may not be familiar and they, they come from another neighborhood and they ride through here, think it's gonna be protected the whole way and they hit the busiest part of it and they don't have that protection. Um, so the only, the only two the, blocks that are not protected in is we only have two blocks that are not protected between Virginia and Alameda and is basically you know, between Virginia and Alaska and Alaska and Dakota, right? This block right here. And it's because of that school area, the school pick up and drop off that we talk to the schools. About. Between Virginia and Dakota is two blocks. Right. And then be between Nevada and Alameda is a third block. Right, we do have protection there. Between Dakota, I'm sorry, do, sorry, you, may, you, you meant, sorry, did I get confused? You, I thought between you Between Nevada and Alameda, right there, it's also not right. protected. So there's three blocks that aren't protected. So it's protected right here between Dakota and Nevada. Right. And then at this location, because of the upcoming intersection, we have and we have to and the narrowness of 35 feet, we have to drop the protection. Right. Because there we still have to maintain the travel lanes through it. So right, right. There there was no way of adding being able to add protection because of how narrow it is. Correct. Okay. So that so that that's that's where that's what I'm saying. Because of the volumes, the places where it should most be protected. Three out of the four blocks, it's not. That's well, like we'll, a significant problem. Well, I mean, we'll get back to you on like the, the volumes and you know get that data to you for. But again, like you know, John, all we're trying to fit a lot into a limited amount of space. We're competing with a lot of complex uh, land use issues, and it's really hard to get a perfect every time. You know, there's like concessions and judgment calls and professional right. expert engineering judgment that has to be made. And that's what you're, we're showing, laying out all out here before you, you know, it's not yeah. a perfect thing every time. Right, unfortunately. 
And John, the, the one thing to the, the southbound traffic south of Alameda between um, uh, Alameda and Nevada, there is protection there. It's just that northbound um, transition uh, between uh, Nevada and Alameda where it drops. So, so to David's point, we're doing what we can to, to fit everything in there. It's only the northbound um, piece between uh, just North Alameda or uh, north of Nevada to, to Alameda. Well, so, so the, right in front of us there, it doesn't have the black marking for the posts yeah. in, the, in the little curbs there on the southbound side. Yeah, Ryan. So let's just confirm that we do have that protection. Uh, Found? I could be mistaken. I'll, I'll confirm yeah. that. I'm sorry about I that. I think because it, it's only two feet. And so I don't think it's wide enough to add a, yeah. a bar through there. That's the. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You, yep, you're right. You're right, Gabby. I, I, okay. I apologize, everybody. Okay. So thank you for taking my question. Yeah, absolutely. Kiara? Yes. Hi, yeah. Gabby. Thank you. Um, thank you for just all the information and for the opportunity to ask a question. I actually, I went to Valverde, I went to KIPP middle school and high school, and I grew up there my whole life. Um, now I work at KIPP Colorado, so I work with our middle school and high school that's located off of Tejon here. I think our biggest concern as a school is just, um, well, one that none of us really knew about the project until this stage, and that's a concern, but understanding that this is moving forward we are concerned with the traffic flow with having four schools next to each other my understanding is that at you, what you have up here is that there will be a removal of the left turn lane and growing up i <laughs> and driving in this area i think that the left turn lane off of alameda and Tejon has been really helpful to decrease traffic because there is an option for cars to turn. Um, and there's quite a lot of backup at that area specifically. So really, I would just like to know more. My, I, my question is just really wanting to understand more what you all are predicting for the flow of traffic and what is, gonna, what is it gonna look like if there is no left turning lane? Um, like, have you guys had the time to scope that area and see how it's currently operating and and figure out a solution for how how we could reduce traffic and support our families and not being frustrated when they're dropping off their students and picking up? Yeah, thank you, Kara, for your for your question. So we did meet our staff team. Actually, our planning team has has had, I think, at this point, like two meetings um, with the different schools in this block to discuss obviously your pickup drop off and obviously the different issues. Um, I can we can definitely provide information about who we've met. Um, obviously it's a little concerning that if you if you work um, in the school um, that I guess uh, that perhaps we you know obviously leadership has not been you know has been not been communicating or I'm not sure but we can certainly check who we have been uh, we've held those meetings with. Um, with regards to the left turn lane, uh, we have conducted analysis on basically, you know, basically what would the, the elimination of that left turn lane, lane would induce um, on, um, on the traffic at this stage. I mean, this is still 60% design, so is definitely not, not 100%. We still need to obviously run, um, obviously, all of this information to our CDOT partners to make sure that obviously that, you know, that, uh, that we're in conformance and in agreement with this, uh, but based on our analysis, it can be removed. We would be obviously taking a look at the signal itself, at the length of the signal, uh, so that we can accommodate, um, you know, obviously knowing that we don't have a dedicated turn so that we can accommodate those left turns and there's enough, you know, get there, you know, obviously the cars that are going southbound, um, you know, are able to go through and there's enough gaps so that those cars can continue moving, you know, making those left turns. Um, but uh, so we have run those analysis and we can, we can conform the, you know, we can make these changes without impacting and with the understanding that we also will be potentially changing the timing signal itself. Uh, but we still have to run these, you know, obviously continue to run these through our, through our partnerships and our internal law. And when it comes specifically to this left turn lane. 
Yeah, thank you, Gabby. That's that's great to know. I just I think we'd all like to just have as much information as possible. So that's wonderful. Absolutely. And if by any chance, Kara, if you can um, obviously either email us if you want to provide your email, obviously in the chat, or I think of the chat you can do a private chat. Um, you can either send if you don't mind sending your information uh, to myself, um, or um, what is it? We also have I believe Kevin. Um, with uh, Wrangle, with OT Consulting, so with any of us from this project team, so that we can basically know, since you know that you work at KIPP, um, maybe have those one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, with you and, and, and uh, your fellow coworkers or whoever may be from the KIPP that, that, that can help us out as well as we continue the design. Yeah, that's perfect. I just shared my information. Um, yeah, our leadership team currently was not aware. So it'd be okay. great to just have like a background on who you all were meeting yeah. and connect okay. with that person. Yeah, thank you so much. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out. All right, hold on, let me see. Okay. Um, all righty. So do we have anybody? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing. It's a Carol lot. Campbell has a question. Carol, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank Carol. you so much. Hi, I live on the corner of South Tejon and West Nevada. I'm on the northeast corner right there. My question is about the um, extensions onto West Nevada. Okay. That's a 24 inches, I mean, feet, 36 feet. Yeah. I know that um, we have always understood that we have to be parked 20 feet away from the crosswalks, but now, so what does the 24 feet and the 36 feet little arrows mean to us? Or we will not be able to park there anymore? Will that include the teachers and everybody? So the, Ryan, yeah. that's a great a great question. Okay, the, the, the width, that's just the width of the street. So 36 is the width of Nevada. And okay. then 24 is the width between the high, the furthest that the bollards stick out to the street. So we don't, oh, the bollards that you're gonna put in? Correct. So from the intersection to basically to this area is 24 feet. So like you mentioned that, you, you know, that right, yeah. 20, 20 feet. So it's, is it's, basically 24 feet oh, it's 24 long. feet wide. It's 24 feet wide, sorry. Wait, no. Oh, the, the, the arrows, so, yeah. Okay, but- Sorry, the width so, of the actual traveling is gonna be 24 feet wide. Correct. Okay, so maybe let me just ask this question. So legally, we have to park 20 feet away from the crosswalk. Where will we be parking now? So, so you, you know, we, I don't know, maybe we could zoom in a little bit. Gabby? Are those little black things going to be structures? Yeah, it's like a, bollards, yes. a, a bollard or flex posts. Because we don't have the the improved uh, corners that other, uh, let's see, we need to get down right. to Nevada and- um, yeah. yeah, I'm getting there, sorry. Thank you. So we don't have the, there wasn't room or something, I don't know why, but we, we didn't have an improved corner. Um, and so we just have the old school um, corner without the cutout or anything. Um, Let's see. Yeah, there we are. So those little black things are going to be they're they're plastic, they're, you know, basically plastic bollards. That's you know, they're vertical. Okay. So here's my question to everybody. So we already have on Nevada, and I think also on Dakota, and yeah, Dakota for sure. Um, we have a parking issue already with the schools. The impact that teachers and uh, Paras and you know after school people park on our streets all day already anyway. So um, if your guys are gonna take what another, because those people don't respect the 20 feet from the crosswalk that is by law, and so you know our parking is always blocked um, yeah. all day long for you know eight to ten hours a day. So if you're gonna squeeze us. Further, I just think everybody's just like the people, well, not as much. The people on Tejon are definitely more impacted. However, it's a concern. And I wonder what the schools in the city will be doing about enforcement of um, 
I mean, do we need to move to like a parking permitted thing on streets now? So, because, you know, the teachers impact us. Yeah, sure. So, so basically this area that you see right here is, is, is just like a, a traditional, uh, like a concrete bulb out when we rebuild this, you know, the streets. And right now the, it's, it's a, it, it should be the same length as that 20 feet of the parking zone by that inter, by the intersection. So this, basically this will enforce that 20 feet because as you can see right here, for example, this car, you know, that you see in the image, it's part yeah. what the area oh, yeah. is not supposed to park. Yeah, Parent. So basically this area will reinforce that and so that there's better yeah. distance for the pedestrians. Correct. Okay. And, okay, okay. Um, it, okay, pickup, parent pickup is going to be impacted. The neighbors are going to be impacted. It's hard to understand in this, you guys, have, having lived here like uh, 33 years on this corner. Um, the, have all of you that are the engineers, have you all been out here during the school drop-offs and pickups? Have you sat there and watched what happens with the double parking and the angled parking and the kids running across the street because their parents opened the car door into Tejon. And I mean, are you all aware of what kind of chaos we deal with? So my question is why in the hell would you add more confusion by adding bike lanes? Like it would be makes much more sense to me that we would encourage bicycles to be on the streets in our neighborhood that are not so congested. This makes no sense to me. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to un, unpack there, Carol. Uh, you know, one is I would say that you know the issues that we see in front of this school we see all across the city, and it's not an isolated incident. Right. So, you know, we're actually really experienced with, unfortunately, is parent bad behavior, and uh, you know we work with the schools, and uh, you know, you know, and and under also understand too that like it, we understand and appreciate that it is a change to the roadway, a change to with people who've lived in the neighborhood for a very long time. And change is never or rarely a welcomed thing. So I, I totally understand that and appreciate that. And um, at the same time, what we are trying to do is make a more predictable and safe environment are just like, you know, transportation planning is a field just like all other fields where we're getting more information and learning and better understanding human behavior. And this uh, you know, represents the best knowledge that we have right now in terms of making things safer on our roadways. You know, we have a pandemic here in Denver and across the country with people dying on our roadways. And so what we're trying to do is make it uh, more safe to limit confusion, limit the craziness by having dedicated space for people to operate and, you know, improving markings, making it clearer uh, and for the type of behavior we expect and want to see. Okay, well, I, I just want to make one more point and then I'll stop so other people can speak up. But so on long my property on Tejon, you know, which is no parking. Um, so, you know, you're technically, it's always full of cars in the morning and the afternoon. So my other question would be, how are you going to enforce this stuff? It's by the physical barriers. Part of the physical barriers, and of course, we obviously have our, our parking enforcement team um, that, that goes out specific, you know, particularly after a new facility has been installed um, to issue warnings and then issue tickets. Okay. Thank you. CV, do you know who's in the Andres? We've got Andres and then John Hanna. And so, um, and then also, sorry, we also only have about 11 more minutes um, of the, the, uh, the discussion. Um, so Andres, go, please go ahead. Andres, you're on. <laughs> the mic is yours. He may be working through interpretation. Oh, oh okay. okay. How do we do CV? Uh, let me see if I can send a message to our interpreter. Oh, then, no, he says he's not getting any response. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, thank yes. you. Okay, okay. My question is, how long ago was the data taken about the traffic? Good question. Do you have that, um, that information? Um, I can answer that question. Great. Oh, please go ahead, Geneva. Yes, so some of this data is historic data that we had at the city. We try not to use anything that is more than a handful of years old. Um, and then other data was collected um, through a kind of a, a data portal and we calibrated it to make sure that it was taking into account the impacts of COVID. So we did take new data and then we sort of compared it to historic data to say, how do these things compare and how do we make sure that they are updated understanding that COVID does have an impact? Okay, my other question is, how uh, do you, are you, how are you building uh, some uh, uh, invasive ideas to residents based on maybe or on a, on a hope that we will increase people to bike, I mean, to ride bikes. How, how do you work that? I mean, how do you just, you said maybe people will choose to ride bikes or we hope that would increase the, the bikes traffic on the streets. How can you spend a lot of money or build build these uh, uh, protected by lines on the streets that us are going to interfere with the residents' lives just based on maybe or hope? Yeah, that, that's a, a really great question. Uh, you know, and it's, it's sometimes it you know it, lo it looks like you know the city is just like operating on blind faith, but the really cool thing is that there's a a large body of research and evidence in this field that talks about this, these exact type of things that we're doing. Like what happens when you change the roadway and add specific treatments, what happens on the roadway? You know, they, you know, that common saying from field of dreams, if you build it, they will come, you know, they actually have shown that it happens all across the world, not just in the United States, but um, it happens when you build better facilities, separate, facilities that are safer and protect people from cars, uh, they get used. And that's based on evidence. It's not fake. It's not a hope. It's scientifically documented, shown with data. And we have even examples here in Denver where we have improved or we have built facilities um, again, that provide that comfort level where people start riding more, uh, obviously, you know, to work, to even just, you know, obviously to even their smaller trips to just to the grocery store. Um, you know, we have it and we are slowly, obviously we have built very strong facilities on the north side, northwest section of Denver and on, you know, on the east and then we're slowly, you know, building out to our southern sections as well. So we already have examples within Denver where we have built the, the facilities and we have seen an increase in bicycle activity. So while there is obviously that, uh, that research, that federal and obviously, as well, international research, we have examples right here in the, within our city that show that our bicycle infrastructure investment, you know, leads to higher than a higher number of people riding their uh, bicycles. I appreciate your, your answer. I just have one more last question. Uh, have you ever also full information about the impact these uh, intrusive uh, uh, ideas has on the residents, how many people is going to be impacted to the point that they will have, uh, you will make their lives miserable. Exactly. Things like that. Have you made a study about that? Because we are residents along Tijon. We live here all year long. And bikes are going to use the, the, the lights only during maybe, as you said, maybe, or perhaps during summer. But we have to to, to face this problem all year long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Have you make a study about putting too much pain into the residents? Exactly. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, oh, go ahead, David. Okay, yeah, I, you know, what I would say is that we, ha we have done um, projects like this all across the city. 
And so it, this isn't just an isolated project. And uh, you know, we what we do typically find is that um, you know as we get closer to implementation, uh, you know, people's concern does seem to amplify. But then what we also find too is that after it goes in and people adjust and uh, you know their lives have settled and behavior has normalized, um, people come to accept it. People come to like it. We have people who say, I didn't like this no. before, but now I do. And some yeah. people probably, and you know, we probably also have some people who say, you know, I still don't like this. Um, but the reality is uh, we're trying to make, you know, Denver a safer place to live with, you know, like Gabby said, more and more people are living, to, moving to Denver. And it's just not an option to make wider roads so that more people can park and more people can drive. We have to give people choices or else no one's going to be able to move anywhere. You won't be able to drive or park anywhere because we've only planned for people parking and driving. We have to give other choice. I have to give people other choices if we want Denver to continue to be a nice place to live where people can choose the type of uh, way they want to get around. These protected bike lanes are not giving the residents here on Tijon that choice. You're taking them away from us. You're forcing this by taking away all our parking. And we'd have to park at the end of these blocks, then from what, Ohio further down going towards Mississippi, that's an extra long block. Those people are gonna even have to walk further than the people on regular block sizes. And it's not a matter of getting to it. Slow the traffic down on this street would be a start. And then you wouldn't have to have the protected bike lanes, but they don't do anything about this this, they've added more stop signs, but just between Ohio and Exposition, come sit in my front yard a couple of nights. You'll listen to the hot rotting, the noise, the people trying to get from that block to the end of this block, tromping yeah. on their vehicles and stuff. It's yeah. ridiculous. I had a guy I, come. I to believe it. Me. I believe it, and this will definitely help with speeding uh, because it narrows but, the lanes. It makes it harder for people to speed. But you're narrowing that, you're making it more dangerous for that. Plus you're making it dangerous for me. I'm gonna to have to walk with my either my pets, my groceries, who knows gonna be around there. So what about my safety? Now I'm not gonna have safety in my own home because I have to walk a number of distance. And you don't know how many people a are gonna be people parking here. They're taking their, our safety away from our own homes. You guys have made these choices and I can see a lot of people did not know about this until it's almost in your final things. We weren't given these surveys. None of us that I've known, and you've got a lot of them that I've seen How posted. How can you take our safety from our own houses? They're just finding this stuff out that you guys have already made these plans. They're not, well, we'd like, like this, give us your input. It's like- these We have plans to notify as many people as possible through of all these meetings throughout this entire year. We have sent, we have flyered, we have done mailers. We have obviously done outreach through the Facebook page, through the Active Living Coalition, through your RNO themselves. Some people aren't. Some people are Yeah, they, you Aside know, from, you know, knocking on your door, we have- That's what should have been done for something this drastic. Flyered. We, we literally flyered down the corridor as well. So we did go- I've never had one of these surveys. And I go through all this stuff. He hasn't had this survey. And so a couple of these other people that I know that are living right next to me, they haven't had these surveys. So somebody that either isn't doing their job or these things aren't getting delivered like you think they are. Something's not right here because we weren't notified. And I go through all the junk mail. I guess I, I understand. I understand, Debbie. That is, it is, that is really frustrating. We make an honest effort to get a hold of everyone and try everything we can. But we got you here, and we're listening to you. You know. Well, if you slow the traffic down and stuff, that would be a bigger start. Than That's in, what we're trying to do. Instead of taking away our parking, because then you're putting more of the residents in jeopardy. They're going to have to get hurt. Some of them had to have kids that they're going to have to walk to, back and forth to their cars because they can't park in front of their homes. I've got small pants. When I get ready to go camping and stuff. I'm going to have to walk back and forth to the end of the box, load my vehicle. So this isn't right. Because you, 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 you don't have alley access to your property. Is that correct? You have packed my alley. Gets, there's times the police have had to come out and tell the people to move their vehicles because they're blocking the alleys. 
So, and, so do you... When you park out there, I don't know how many flat tires I've gotten from driving up and down the alleys because they're not maintained right. And, and like I said, anytime and every time I've parked in the alley, my vehicle has been broken into. He has broke, had been broken in yes. what, 11 times when he parks out back. And he even has it where it comes up to into his yard more instead of just on the outside part of it. I've even put a part of a fence out there to protect some of my stuff. It, you guys aren't looking at the whole circle of everything because you're putting a lot of us in harm's way just to protect, widen the sidewalks or something a little bit more, or give them a little room instead of taking all our parking. And that's what it's gonna do. It, and it's not so right, we don't we, have a place to park. So we have to, it's 701, um, and obviously out of respect for everybody, please submit your comments. Um, I have, but nobody listens. So please submit your comments. Um, obviously we, uh, the surveys will be open until December 18th. Um, we're gonna, you know, you see that on your on your screen right now, uh, the bit.ly, but if someone can actually also post it on the on the chat itself. Um, obviously, you know, we, uh, if you don't mind emailing us at bike at denvergov.org as well. Um, and we can still continue to schedule those office hours so that we can talk to you one on one about this design. Again, we're at 60% design. We're definitely heading into 90, but this is sort of that our last opportunity to submit those comments. Again, that survey is open until December 19th. And then obviously we also have our project uh, hotline itself. So obviously we do want to know about all of these different issues. Um, if you don't have, you know, a driveway in front, you know, in, in your house and you don't have alley access, you don't have a garage. Um, obviously that is something that we definitely want to hear about as well. So uh, please submit your comments or let us know, uh, reach out to us so we can try to those one-on-ones. Uh, December 19th is our deadline for this round. Um, and so with that, we wanna thank you uh, for joining us this, this evening. Thank you all. I will be ending the meeting in just a minute. I hope you all have a lovely evening. And just to reiterate, uh, please contact Denver. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.